I guess five or six o'clock in the evening, uh, we became aware that uh, the river continued to rise, that uh, they were closing the bridges. Uh, people were reporting that travel was uh, impossible outside the state limits according. And at that point, uh, I came in contact with two visitors, two, two separate uh, carloads of visitors who were trapped in the city and really had no place to go. So I told them if, uh, if things didn't work out, they could come back to the glass center later in the evening, which they did. And altogether, there were about 17 people and two dogs gathered up in the uh, executive club uh, trying to wait out the rain at that point, not knowing it was going to flood. First thing we noticed was that the, the water started to flow down from the west uh, down what is now Museum Way and began to slowly circle the entire Glass Center parking lot, uh, both the front and back, and eventually floated and filled up down in the Stuben factory. And it was just a big swirling water as, as, it, as it came in, uh, in there. And uh, we had no idea how far the water was going to come up in the building but it slowly stopped running and began to sort of slowly fill up the building. Uh, at that point, uh, we knew we, we were gonna have a major problem. I kept running up and down the stairs in the glass center to see what was going on. You could hear glass crashing all over the place, all sorts of funny noises. And I finally ended up down in the museum. Uh, I wanted to see if there was anything I could do to save, save anything, because I knew at that point the water was just outside the window. And I wanted to save the uh, the Dragon Stem Goblet with a wonderful 16th century Venusian piece. And I thought if I could get that out of the case, I could save one object. And I tried to get into the case and absolutely could not get in without fear of breaking the goblet itself. So at that point, uh, the floors were whistling in the museum from the water rising, forcing the air up through the floor. And then later it sort of turned to little bubbles. And at that point I realized it was time to get out of there and get back up to uh, join the others in the dining room. It reached the point where we decided we had to get out of the, uh, the executive club and our only alternative was to get to the roof of the glass center. And we opened the doors and fortunately there was a ladder outside and we were able to get all of these people to the roof including two very elderly ladies, both one with a major heart problem, we were very concerned about her, and managed to get the dogs upstairs. And as some of the men in the group who had had army experience, uh, Picked, some lum picked up some lumber we had on the floor and began to make a lean-to on the roof. And we literally rolled up the carpets on the dining room floor and carried them to the roof and made a lean-to. And from that point, we could just see that every, everything around us, as far as we could see, was flooded. Our glass center guard had a walkie-talkie, and he was able to, as I remember, communicate with the state police that there were 17 people and two dogs on the roof of the glass center and the water was continuing to rise. It was not too long after that that a state police helicopter appeared and landed on the roof of the glass center and began to evacuate the group, I think, in, in three or four people at a time. So he made a number of trips back and forth. So we just flew around Corning for about 15 or 20 minutes with a real view of the, of the city as it was flooded at that time. It was a very, very wonderful sight if you see a flood from that altitude. And finally, he took me back to the... Uh, Renfield Street School and uh, I unloaded up there. My wife was very happy to see that I had made it after a few hours. And we stayed up in that school for a while and eventually uh, moved to another home. Mm -hmm.